having business before this honorable court shall draw near and give their attention and they shall be heard. God save the United States and this honorable court. The first case we're going to hear is Roanoke School Board against Kylie. Are council ready? You may proceed. Mr. Chief Justice, and may it please the court. My name is Greg Rosenbaum. My colleague, Mr. Schiffman, and I represent the appellant in this action, the Roanoke School Board and its members in their official capacities. The case comes to this court on direct appeal from a decision of a three-judge court in the Western District of Virginia, which held invalid the school board's discharge of Harriet B. Kiley, appellee. The school board had discharged appellee a Roanoke Central High School teacher for two reasons. After a brief statement of the facts, I will consider one reason for the discharge, that appellee refused to agree to a school board policy prohibiting the teaching of subjects which work to undermine the moral and legal values of the community. Mr. Schiffman will deal with the other and completely independent ground for appellee's discharge, that she was a practicing homosexual. The facts are these. Appellee's discharge resulted from statements she made to her 11th grade civics class. In discussing the nature of law, Appellee advised her class that many laws are based on values not reflective of moral truth, but of subjective opinion. As examples of laws designed to protect the established order, Appellee discussed punishment of and discrimination against homosexuals. She stated unequivocally that private homosexual relations between consenting adults harmed no one and advocated that the law should not impose or sanction punishment or discrimination Counsel, against you say she advocated this. Did the district court find that she advocated this practice? Yes, Your Honor. The district court found that she advocated or at least intimated. And in this case, I think that well, it's clear it, that... Well, did it differentiate it, between uh, discussing and advocating? It did not dis differentiate beyond the statement that the facts as the court found it were these, that Appellee advocated or at least intimated that private consensual... Well, is a finding that she advocated or at least intimated equivalent to a finding that she advocated? I think, Your Honor, that it is. If we avoid dealing with the semantic distinctions that can be made between the word intimation and advocacy, I think that it's quite clear that the term intimation is much closer to advocacy than it is to inquiry or discussion. I think that in the flow and context of the district court's opinion, the finding of advocacy, if we were to characterize it as a one-word finding, is much closer to what the district court found than any Does it matter discussion. whether she advocated or merely discussed in your theory of the case? Your Honor, in our theory of the case, it does not really matter whether she advocated or Well, then you could accept us to just assume the district court merely found discussion then. We could assume that, Your Honor. It wouldn't but make any difference to your argument. Our case, I think that our case is stronger in the, in the event that she advocated. Why? And therefore... Why is it stronger? I think, Your Honor, that when we discuss the balance that must be made in, in, ad, in academic freedom issues, that is, between the interests of a teacher to speak and the interests of the school board to maintain the school system and the interest of parents to bring their children up in the moral development way that they wish, that the teacher's rights are much more limited in a First Amendment context when she advocates something contrary to the moral legal values of the community as opposed to when she merely discusses You them. think the First Amendment gives less protection to advocacy than it does to discussion. Is that your point? I think, Your Honor, that in the school context, when a delicate balance must be struck by the you, court in concerning the facts yes, of the case, your yes, yes, it does make a difference. Appelli, at the next class session, publicly proclaimed her own homosexuality. After an interview with her department head, 
the high school principal and the school board president, followed by a formal hearing before the school board at Can I interrupt for a moment? Is the, yes, sir. Is the proclamation of a preference for homosexuality or that she was a practicing homosexual? Your Honor, the second reason for the discharge, which Mr. Schiffman will address himself to, is that she was a practicing homosexual. It is noted the in the court find that? the district court found that in a footnote to its opinion, it found in a post-trial memorandum that Apelli had testified before the school board that she was a practicing homosexual. And as a footnote to our original brief points out, the distinction between preferences and practices is made clear, and she was clearly fired for being a practicing homosexual, something with which Apelli does not take issue. Well, who determined the values? I'm Who sorry, Your Honor? Who determined the human values of the, that you're talking about? The school board? Or Your the Honor, parents? Or who? The values which the schools are meant to protect yes, and who develop. Who determined that? Who determined that? The school board did, Your Honor. It well, did how, take do they, in, how do they know? Well, the traditional role of school boards in our society has been one of determining just precisely what local school systems are going to do. They determine what subjects will be taught and what subjects will not be taught. And under Virginia school law, individual school boards are challenged with the authority to ensure that moral instruction and training exists in every subject matter that is presented to students in the school system. Well, how do they determine it? Well, Your Honor, I cannot specifically speak for the individual members of the school board or how well, they arrived at the consensus. you have the record in front of you. How do they determine it? There is some evidence, Your Honor, that they determine the values of the community from a referendum passed by the Roanoke Central High School Parents Association. That was just a statement which they took as support for their initial feelings that those were the values of the community. Now, but are, further, the, are the values the values in Roanoke? Are they values, since we're a constitutional area, are they values in the country? Your Honor, I think as this court has consistently recognized, the educational system of this country relies on local officials and local control over education. And local Therefore, values, I would submit that the values, values yes, I would values. submit that the values and the decisions of the school board should be the local values. And those values must be weighed then against the constitutional values that Apelli asserts in that local context. Well, Mr. Otherwise, Rosen, yes, Your Honor. Mr. Rosenbaum, are you saying we might decide this case in one way, arising from Roanoke, and another way if it was a Boston school board? I'm saying, Your Honor, that that may indeed be the case, given the fact that you must strike that balance. Well, the, figure, the figures in Washington, where we all three sit, were just released in this area that you're talking about. Yes, Your Honor. There are more abortions than there are births. There are more illegitimate births than there are legitimate births. What is the family value there? <laughs> Well, Your Honor. <laughs> hating to cast aspersions on the place from which you've come. <laughs> I think that the values in Washington could fairly be said to be less old fashioned than they may be in Roanoke, Virginia. But we don't mind the claim. Now, relevant to this question, it seems to me, is that you purport in your argument to balance the interests of the teachers, the students, the board, and the parents. But the record indicates that the reason given by the, for the board's rejection uh, was that it rejected any teaching, quote, any teaching of subject matter that works to undermine the acceptance by students of the values their parents have trained them to follow. So it seems to me that, uh, that uh, the way the case comes to us uh, is it was, it's really the parents who uh, the board felt to constrain to uh, follow. Your Nobody Honor, else. The term that we use, the community and parental values, is a shorthand way of s expressing the values of the parents, which make up the uh, polity of Roanoke, Virginia, and the Roanoke School Board. We're talking about community values or those values which are shared by those parents, by the adults in the community. But if the emphasis is on the parents, what does your feeling about Planned Parenthood be Danforth? 
where the parents uh, say in this matter it was not regarded by the Supreme Court as of any significance. Your Honor, I believe that the facts of Planned Parenthood v. Danforth taking place as it did in an area where the court had found a fundamental right in an individual woman to terminate her pregnancy are quite different and can be easily distinguished. What I would point out is that the Supreme Court of the United States in its decision in Roe v. Wade found that in the first trimester of pregnancy, there was a fundamental right of an individual to terminate her pregnancy. There could be no legitimate state interference in the first trimester. In deciding Danforth with Mr. Chief Justice, then Justice Stevens, dissenting on specifically this point, the court held that the state could not delegate to the parents a power that it legitimately could not hold itself. Mr. Justice Stevens then respectfully dissented on just that issue. But and Mr. Rosenbaum, if I might interrupt, uh, <laughs> if I understand you correctly, you're saying that the discussion of the subject of homosexuality in the classroom is not permissible because that's not a fundamental right like the right the abortion decision is. Now, if you're right on that, don't your two points merge into just one point? You mean with regard to the privacy? You're going to argue, your, your colleague is going, Mr. Schiffman is going to argue the basic right point, and it seems to me from what you just said, that's a critical part of your argument as well. I think, Your Honor, we're discussing two rights here. One is the question of whether or not a fundamental right exists to engage in homosexual practices. The other is... And you're saying it does not. It's unlike the abortion. That's correct, and that is the position Mr. Schiffman And that's Schiffman what Mr. Schiffman argue. is also going to argue. That's correct. In the case of the teacher's rights to speak in the classroom, we're dealing with rights and privileges that a teacher may have in a different area, the First Amendment area, where we think the precedence of this court clearly indicate a teacher's right is quite limited, so as not to encompass speaking about homosexuality. There are two basically different rights here, the right of privacy derived however it may be. Would she have a right to First speak Amendment about rights. abortion? I think, Your Honor, that she would have the right to discuss abortion as long as the Would it she have a right to say she'd had an abortion? Could she Honor, be discharged for saying, I've had an abortion? Your Honor presents a very difficult case, certainly, and one quite different Well, does from it differ own. from this case in any respect except this respect in which your colleague is going to argue? Yes, Your Honor, I think that it does differ in the sense that the moral and legal values of the community, according to the opinion of Mr. Justice Blackmun in Roe v. Wade, are such that there is no fundamental value system against abortion. What if all the parents in Roanoke uh, went on record as saying they opposed abortion? In that case, Your Honor, the school, be the, same case, the school board would be able to remove the discussion of abortion from the curriculum. As Mr. Justice Black found himself, a believer that the First Amendment was an absolute prohibition against limitations of the right to speak, well, no. in his concurring opinion in Epperson v. Arkansas. Are you, are you talking just marital and sexual matters or would you would your argument go just the same way if a town went entirely for mr ford that you couldn't discuss mr carter's program or if the, if they or, or what would you say with respect to the vietnam war if the majority of the family thought that uh, parents thought that uh, there shouldn't be a war or there should be a war that couldn't be discussed those are values aren't they just as important as as uh, the other values Yes, Your Honor, they are values. And so our, pos our position on this issue would be quite simply that if the school board, in its role as the elected, politically accountable representatives of the people, determined that some subject should not be part of the curriculum of the public school system, then a teacher could not in class discuss those values or those subjects. Well, that's, and that's just McCarthyism, isn't it? That's, that's straight McCarthyism, isn't it? I think not, Your Honor. But what's the difference? I think that. McCarthyism suggests that one cannot speak at all to certain subjects yes. in any circumstance. In the classroom. And I think as this court clearly pointed out, there is a distinction between the rights of a teacher to speak as a citizen, commenting on matters of public concern, and outside the classroom, and a teacher's right to speak on matters inside the classroom. Well, that was the in, distinction in the, the court drew in Pickering. In the corridors, you include classroom. <laughs> Your Honor, we admit that certainly in the, in, in the drugstore, that's all near children, right? 
in, dis in discussion with other teachers in the corridor, in the playground, certainly we would not suggest that Apelli's rights of free speech should be constrained in the political arena. Rather, we suggest that when she faces a captive audience in the classroom of impressionable young people, that she should not be allowed to present values contrary to the moral and legal values of the community. Even though she presents both sides? In the event that she presents both sides, well, Honor, we here. have a completely different case that's than we have here. That's what she was doing here. She presented both sides. No, Your Honor, I think the record points out that Apelli took one position and never suggested that there was another side to the She position. said there was a law the other way. She admitted that there was a law, correct. and her entire discussion went to the view that there was no support at all well, for said didn't law. her acknowledgment of her own uh, uh, practices, wasn't that made for the very purpose of indicating that there might be two sides and that they should evaluate uh, the fact that she was a homosexual and appraising what she said? Your Honor, Apelli may, by her admission of being a practicing homosexual, have indicated that there may be two sides. That admission, if it was designed to serve just that purpose, came somewhat too late, three days after she had presented but one side of the issue. And if you look at the testimony... Do you think she would have been discharged had she not said anything on Monday? I think, Your Honor, yes, she should have been discharged if she refused to agree to the policy of the school board not to say the things that she said Friday again in the future. However, she steadfastly resolved, the district courts found, in light of warnings that her job was at stake to refrain from making Friday's comments again to her classes in the future. You keep referring to the moral values of the community, uh, and you uh, argue, for example, that the right to privacy cannot comprehend homosexual conduct because that conduct is not rooted in the collective conscience. Uh, uh, do you think that uh, uh, the right to have an abortion was rooted in the collective conscience of the United States before the Supreme Court decided the abortion cases? Do you think that desegregation of the public schools is rooted in the conscience of the American public before the uh, Brown case was decided? And this raises a question, at least in my mind, which comes first? Does the Supreme Court educate uh, and is ahead of, the con ahead of the consensus, or is it always behind the consensus that you apparently indicate that it should be? He doesn't Your want there to be any chance for there to be anything but a consensus, do you? If I may address both questions simultaneously, let me deal with them in three parts. <laughs> <laughs> Who is that third judge that asked the third part? <laughs> Actually, Your Honor, I have a two-part answer to your question and a one-part answer to Mr. Justice's answer. Let me address myself to your question uh, merely because you asked it first. <laughs> first of all, with regard to the test of a value being rooted in the collective conscience of our people, that is the second test that we set forth with regard to whether or not something is a fundamental right. The first test, of course, is the paradigm of marriage, family, and procreation. With regard to values that, in, in, in my second part of the answer, with regard to values that are rooted in the collective conscience of our people, I deal with your two examples thusly. First of all, the example of the abortion decision. When we read Mr. Justice Blackman's opinion for the court, we find that the largest portion of the opinion was devoted to proving that the values contrary to abortion were not rooted in the collective conscience and history of our people. Hence, I would say that the Supreme Court in deciding the abortion decision paid heed to the second test we set forth. 100 years of anti-abortion statutes? 100 years of anti-abortion statutes, Your Honor, Mr. Justice Blackman considered was not sufficient to be rooted in the collective conscience and history of our people. 200 years, is, Your Honor, it, might have what been What does it different. take to root? <laughs> Mr. Rosenbaum, uh, what uh, part of the Constitution do you find the language about the collective conscience of the people in? <clears throat> Your Honor, what, just, what is the constitutional provision we're talking about here? Uh, Your Honor, just as the right to privacy is not rooted in any specific language in the Constitution, nor also are its contours, since the Constitution, as this court has often found, never explicitly says that there is a right to privacy, nor does it say where that right to privacy exists and where it does not exist with specific language. So I cannot point 
any more than a Pelley could point to specific language in the Constitution granting a right to privacy to any limitations on it. But isn't the right to privacy that's rooted in the Constitution and what that right is uh, changes and grows and develops from time to time and, uh, and the Constitution uh, as viewed by the Supreme Court is not always behind the, the consensus but maybe in advance of it. Your Honor, with regard to that question, let me again answer in two parts. First of all, I would say that where this court has derived the right to privacy, specifically in the Constitution, has varied with pluralities and majorities in differing decisions. Mr. Justice Goldberg looked to the Ninth Amendment. Many other justices, Mr. Justice uh, Brandeis, for example, looked to the Fourth and the Fifth Amendments. Other justices have looked to the First and the Fourteenth Amendments. It seems that the right to privacy exists in some form of zones or penumbras from many amendments. That seemed to be the consensus that emerged in the Griswold decision. The Griswold decision drew very heavily on Mr. Justice Harlan's dissent in Poe v. Omen. And it is there where Mr. Justice Harlan, in discussing the origins or emanations of the right to privacy from the various penumbras of the amendments to the Bill of Rights, said that there was this limitation of the right to things that were in the collective conscience of our people. But secondly, with regard to whether or not the Supreme Court is ahead, equal to, or behind the times, I think that we have to look at the situation in terms of the Supreme Court's jurisdiction to hear cases or controversies that come before it. Certainly, the Supreme Court, at the t any time in the past hundred years, hearing an abortion case, might have decided the same way it decided in Roe v. Wade. The situation was not presented to the court, or at least the court decided not to hear the situation, until Roe v. Wade came before it. Hence, it's not a question that the Supreme Court must necessarily always be behind the time. It may be equal to the consensus. But it has to wait until a specific case or controversy comes before it in order to make said adjudication. adjudication. Excuse me. Mr. Rosenbaum, I interrupted you before uh, when you didn't really have a chance to give the third part of your answer to the simultaneous question. I wonder if you <laughs> can do that now. I've been waiting. <laughs> if Your Honor would, would allow me to ask Mr. Justice Gazelle to repeat again his question, um, I said, I'll be happy to answer it. You're anxious to have a consensus so there can't be any disagreement, aren't you? All children taught the way their parents believed no change, no chance for thought, no chance for change in moral or, or social values. It makes it easier for the court, doesn't it? There isn't any problem then. It does make it easier for the court, Your Honor, but you I think, think that your you proposition... Do you think that's the kind of society a uh, constitution envisions? No, I don't, and I don't think that's the kind of society that our position envisions, Your Honor. I think that what you we think are... they're just too young to ha think at 17? I don't think that they are too young to think at 17, well, but I do think that we chance? must draw a line, Your Honor. And that line this court has recognized can be drawn by the legislature where it decides the line ought to be drawn. This court where the legislature has not drawn a line in making its decisions with regard to parochial school funding has drawn a bright line between high school and college with regard specifically to the impressionability of young people and their susceptibility to views which may be contrary to their own or similar to their own, and, and yet they are not free to respond to them. And that is the citation that we point out to compare Tilton v. Richardson with Lemon v. Kurtzman, where Mr. Chief Just former Chief Justice Berger, uh, <laughs> makes clear the distinction. Essentially, Your Honor, we believe that it's clear from this court's precedents that a teacher's rights to free expression are not unlimited in the classroom setting. In Pickering versus the Board of Education, the court recognized the teacher's right to speak is more limited when she speaks as an employee of the state than when she speaks as an average citizen. Mr. Rosenbaum, yes, just sir. one more First Amendment question. You do concede that the First Amendment has some application to what a teacher may say in the classroom, do you? Certainly, Your Honor, we believe that the First Amendment has application in the classroom. And then I take it it's your position that what the First Amendment uh, protects depends on the content of what is said. Your Honor, we believe that given due notice that certain subjects ought not to be discussed in the classroom. So say everything, complete notice on everything, but there's still some things that the teacher has a right to say notwithstanding all the notice. Isn't that what you just conceded? Teacher has the right to comment on matters of public concern as long as the interests of the state do not outweigh them. 
I think that's the lesson of the Pickering case with regard to a teacher's First she Amendment rights. She didn't, clearly couldn't say the governor was a crook. Well, it depends, Your Honor. As you pointed out, the citizens of Roanoke might have a moral and legal value that the governor was a crook. Well, you would have and to take a, a Gallup poll first before she could discuss the conduct of the governor? <laughs> no, Your Honor, and I think that is precisely the point that we make. The court cannot be responsive to public opinion. It cannot commission Gallup polls to determine the values of the community in order to strike this balance. Rather, it should defer in its judgment as to the values that the school board seeks to defend to the school board, political, accountable people who are educational experts, whose entire training, purpose, and institutional capability is directed toward determining what those values may be. If the school board is it your understanding that all school board members have full-time employment on the board? Is that your? No, Your Honor. I don't think that they have full-time employment on the board, but nor do state legislatures necessarily have full-time employment as legislators, nor members of Congress have full-time employment as, as <laughs> Congress. <laughs> as recent events all too sorely point out. <laughs> Suppose, suppose the teacher is an enthusiastic heterosexual and likes to share her... Uh, <laughs> and likes to consume amounts of the classroom time sharing her happiness in that regard with the... <laughs> do, you, do you think the board would be justified in dismissing her? Although she is enthusiastic about family values. <laughs> I think, Your Honor, that if the school board made a determination that such subject matter should not be discussed in the classroom, that the school board's wishes should be obeyed. In other words, we don't think that it necessarily is a matter of heterosexuality versus homosexuality. It is a question of what curriculum and Sexual, course content ought be. Any kind of sex. Don't talk about it, right? Well, it depends, again, on the situation. And in college, of course, we have not the problems of a captive audience. Mr. Rosenbaum, uh, your, your time has expired. And I, if your counsel, your co-counsel is to have his share, I think perhaps we should let him try to take on from here. Thank you, Mr. Chief Justice. And I thank the court. Chief Justice, and may it please the court. My name is David Schiffman, and I too represent the school board. My purpose is to defend the school board's policy of not employing as a teacher any individual who engages in homosexual practices. We contend, first, that there is no fundamental constitutional right to engage in homosexual practices. Second, that the school board's policy of not employing practicing homosexuals as teachers does not deny equal protection of the law. And third, that this policy is justified by compelling state interests. Do you think it makes any difference that the policy was decided as a means of getting rid of this woman rather than being a policy decided that the woman had an opportunity to be aware of before she went to work for the school board? There are criminal statutes in the Commonwealth of Virginia dealing with homosexuality. Oh, sure. And there, are also, uh, there is also a teacher dismissal statute, um, which, suggests, which explicitly states that grounds for dismissal for a teacher um, are things like immorality, or crimes of moral turpitude, um, or conduct unbecoming a teacher. So I think that there was ample notice to the appellee that hom her home for practicing homosexuality was, was adequate grounds for dismissal. I would like to begin by addressing the first issue, which I think will dispose of this entire case. There is no, 
there is no fundamental constitutional right to engage in homosexual practices. Or not to engage in homosexual practices. There are too many negatives in that That's sentence, right. me, Your Honor. <laughs> this court has repeatedly endorsed two tests, one general and one specific, for delimiting the scope of constitutional protection in this area. According to the more general test, only personal rights which can be deemed fundamental or implicit in the concept of ordered liberty are held to be entitled to constitutional protection. According to the more specific test, the Constitution protects the intimacies and the basic decisions associated with family, marriage, and procreation, as well as child rearing and, educa and education. With regard to the second test, how do you explain the Eisenstadt case? I read the Eisenstadt case, Your Honor, as exclusively an equal protection case. Um, at one point in the court's discussion, what is the class uh, that was discriminated against in that case? Unmarried individuals. And what right did they seek to assert that the court protected? The court held that whether or not there was a right among mar for married people to use contraceptive devices, that the state could not discriminate as between married individuals and unmarried individuals in fashioning its laws in that area. I view it exclusively as an equal protection case. And, and it not di discriminated against unmarried individuals. Why are they a class that's any more entitled to protection than homosexuals? In that case, the court explicitly applied a rational relationship test. It did not view the group as entitled to extraordinary constitutional protection. Well, I'm not sure you answered my question. Why is the class of unmarried persons entitled to more constitutional protection than homosexuals? Or do you think it is not? What's I think that they are entitled to exactly the same protection, namely that state legislation drawing a line on the basis of married, of, of whether What, what did that state legislation do? It interfered with their right to engage in illicit sex, didn't it? No, the state statute um, was merely a statute governing the distribution of contraceptive devices. Does Virginia have a statute against fornication? Yes, it does, Your Honor. Well, and what did that statute do? What did the, what did the case hold then? The Eisenstadt case? Yes, with respect to what right did it protect in the people, the unmarried group? The right to do what? It protected... <laughs> My reading... Was it anything more than the right to fornicate? The and right, if not, what, why, wasn't that, why isn't that right? I think my reading of the Eisenstadt case is that it said that unmarried individuals have exactly the same rights as married individuals in the sense that the state may not draw lines between being married and being unmarried um, on the basis uh, in, in its statutes without a rational relationship. They were claiming to be treated equally. And that is my reading of the Eisenstadt case. Um, the court in that case explicitly declined to hold that there is a fundamental constitutional right to use contraceptive devices. But even if the court had so held, I would nevertheless argue that it fits within the paradigm of marriage, family, and procreation, with an emphasis on the last element. Because throughout history, an individual's decision whether or not to procreate has always been thought of as beyond the power of the state except in extraordinary circumstances. This is to be contrasted with homosexuality, where throughout history there have been laws saying that homosexual practices are illegal. And that is the crucial distinction between these two areas. Well, haven't there been laws throughout history saying that uh, sexual activity between unmarried persons is disapproved of? Yes, Your Honor. Now again, I'm not, tell me again what the distinction is. I think that Homosexual practices are entitled to no more protection than any But other. I mean, insofar as you're talking about tradition and history, don't the two come out about the same? In the United States, there has almost always been, have almost always been statutes against fornication and adultery. Um, and they are, those activities are entitled to no more constitutional protection than our homosexual practices. But doesn't this emphasis upon, uh, that you put on the long history of, of uh, anti-homosexual uh, attitudes in this country, doesn't that alone, doesn't that run you right in then to the question that 
question that the homosexuals are a suspect class? No, Your Honor. In this particular area of suspect class. They have a long classes. history of being discriminated against. You, you say that? Oh, yes. Well, isn't that one of the earmarks of a suspect class? I don't think that that is a sufficient condition for a suspect class. I would analogize to the area of race, because with respect to race, there has been a societal judgment repudiating a history of discrimination on the basis of race. The 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments to the Constitution represent the clearest and the most profound statement of our people repudiating the history of discrimination. In contrast, even today, the majority of states has fiercely resisted even liberalizing laws with respect to homosexual practices. And thus, there is a crucial distinction between race and homosexual practices. I would, in addition, like to point out that as recently as last term, in the case of Matthews v. Lucas, the court once again declined to find, um, declined to find illegitimate, illegitimate children to be a suspect class over the Chief Justice's dissent. Um, and that group, too, had been subjected to a history of discrimination. But even if one were to endorse the Chief Justice's viewpoint with respect to suspect classes in that area, it would not apply here. Because a number of members of this court have expressed concern with legislation based on outmoded stereotypes and overbroad generalizations, which are based on habit rather than analysis. But the this only act you have here is speech, isn't it? You don't have anything else. There's no act of homosexuality involved. She didn't commit homosexuality in the school with any children. No, I Your mean, Honor. She didn't do anything. She just spoke. She admitted to being a practicing homosexual. Well, and she, she said she was, yes. Yes. Um, but but what, act, what act did she engage in? The now, act now, the state can outlaw acts. But it can't, but, the, but there's no act here. What act did she engage in except to speak? She spoke in the school. She committed her homosexual practices outside of the school. Well, I know, but she just spoke, didn't she? But nevertheless, the expert testimony which we have presented shows, um, at least there is substantial evidence from which the school board could conclude, that the presence of a known homosexual teacher in the classroom could result in impaired sexual development and orientation of her students. Well, now, is that evidence, uh, does the record show that that evidence on which you rely was actually before the school board? Or is that evidence you put in at the trial? The evidence that is in the record was put in at the trial. So how can you say the school board relied on it? I didn't, if I said that, I didn't mean it, Your Honor. The school board, their evidence exists from which the school board could reasonably conclude that this is but true. But even after you put that evidence, the district uh, court didn't make a finding uh, that the evidence was correct, did it? No. The district court found, found the evidence equally balanced. That is correct, Your Honor. So what should we do? Should we make an independent review of that evidence? I do not believe so, Your Honor. Well, then why are we talking about it? <laughs> I do not believe that it would be appropriate for this court to try to resolve complex empirical questions of this nature. The causes of homosexuality are very subtle and they are difficult to explain and there is a great deal of controversy about it. For that reason, I do not think that it would be appropriate for the courts to try to arrive at their own judgment because courts lack the expertise in this area. Aren't, aren't we supposed to have a little common sense? And don't we know that if you don't tell young people anything about sex, you're gonna have just as much trouble as if you tell them something about it? That could quite possibly Can be true. Can we take judicial notice of that obvious fact? <laughs> this court can most certainly take judicial notice of that fact. Well, then, then the testimony isn't worth anything, is it? Whether they relied on it or not. Some people think it's bad to tell them about it. Other people say it's bad for them not to be told about it. There's no issue. Well, Your Honor has shown that there is very much an issue of disagreement among the psychologists. Well, fine. And I think that it is better, and not to decide this case, obviously, is to decide the controversy by saying that there is an insubstantial relationship there. So if this court were to hold against us, the court would, in effect, be agreeing with the appellee's experts. But I do not think that it is appropriate for this court to resolve the empirical matters, but rather to, to defer to the judgment 
of the politically accountable group of educational experts who sit on the school board. Even though their, their view is, contradicts everything anybody knows and can take a, a common knowledge of. I'm, Just I'm, walking down the street. I must, I must respectfully disagree with Your Honor's view of co common knowledge, well, with all due respect. Do you uh, think that there has to be a compelling state interest or a rational state interest? That depends upon how this court decides. Oh, well, no, that's where we are. You're, I'm asking for your help. Oh, there, there Do you must think it's, is a, we, we have to find a compelling state interest or simply a rational state interest? I do not believe that there is a fundamental interest in engaging in homosexual practices. And accordingly, I believe that a rational relationship test is all that need be applied here. Well, there's a possible, there's a possible relationship between everything, isn't there? It's difficult for me to answer Your Honor's question, <laughs> <laughs> except metaphysically. Um, the scientists which we presented in the court below um, suggested that there very definitely is a relationship. In addition, there is a, a relationship between what? I lost you, Mr. Schiff. Okay. <laughs> that the presence of a known homosexual teacher in the classroom could impair the sexual development and orientation of students. That if the teacher is respected, the students would accept the teacher and accept her as a person and accept all of her attributes, including her homosexuality, and accept the idea that there is nothing wrong with being a homosexual. Now what uh, some people so testified, and uh, now what conclusion do we draw from that again? The conclusion is that Apelli's continued employment as a teacher would endanger the sexual development and orientation of Is the it students. necessary for us to make that finding to sustain your position? If this court applies a rational relationship test, in other words, if it finds that no fundamental rights or suspect classifications are involved, then a rational relationship will uphold this. We, we argued other rational, other justifications in the brief which we believe are rationally related to the appellee's discharge. Let me be sure I understand your argument, counsel. I, I sometimes get quite confused on what a rational relationship is. Rational relationship between what? Between what are we appellee's trying to do? discharge and the state's policy of protecting the sexual development and orientation of its children. And you say if there is some rational, some conceivably rational relationship then unless she has a fundamental uh, a right to be a homosexual, that the discharge must be upheld. I think so. If I could rephrase it in my own words, I'd be a little bit more confident in agreeing. If there is no fundamental relationship involved, then the discharge must be upheld if it is rationally related to a legitimate state purpose. If fundamental interests are involved, then the state, then the discharge can be upheld only now, if there's Are we a talking about fundamental interests of the uh, person who is a homosexual, or are we talking about fundamental interests of the state? Fundamental, fundamental interests. Interest, or fundamental interests of the children? What, what is the of the, inter, of the individual who is a homosexual. And the question is whether she has a compelling motivation to be a homosexual, is that it? <laughs> the issue is whether there is a fundamental constitutional right to engage in homosexual practices. And that turns on the compelling nature of the, of the interest as in the frame of reference of the person in the class. As I well, ordinarily, this court's methodology is first to consider the interests of, of the plaintiff and to decide whether, their, whether those interests are constitutionally fundamental. And then, only if it finds that there is a fundamental interest, to consider what the state's offsetting policy justifications are. So the typical methodology is first to consider whether there is a fundamental interest, and if there is, then to consider whether the state has a compelling policy justification for its action. We believe that there is no fundamental interest under either of the two general tests which this court has endorsed in the privacy area. Under the general test, those personal liberties which can be deemed fundamental or implicit in the concept of ordered liberty, it is, I think, clear that homosexual practices have no claim to such special protection. Isn't it conceivable that a, a particular group can have at least some of the characteristics of the suspect class without having all of the full-fledged characteristics that maybe another group has? But if they have some, 
of the characteristic of suspect class in the sense of being having a history of, of uh, opposition and discrimination against them. Is it conceivable there could be an inter a standard intermediate between the rational relationship uh, and the compelling interest to which uh, ought and justice to be applied to that group? Well, this court could so hold, of course. I don't believe that the well, court Well, don't, don't you think that, 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 that the, some of the sex discrimination cases like Reed v. Reed and uh, Weinberger v. Weisenfeld maybe are fall in that category? Those but, cases could be read that way. And I have no substantial quarrel with this court reading those cases that way because all, of, all that those cases asked for was a fair and substantial relationship between means and ends. And I'm absolutely confident that we can produce that and that we have. However, I would like to distinguish this situation involving homosexuality from the situation involving sex or involving, um, say, illegitimate children, because this statute is not drawn on the basis of overbroad generalizations or outmoded stereotypes. It is not a product of habit rather than analysis. What the school board did was to make a specific judgment, which we believe was scientifically supported in this particular case, um, that the presence of a known homosexual in the classroom could impair the normal sexual development and orientation of her well, children. Well, are you saying the scientific evidence had more impact on the school board than the resolutions adopted unanimously by the parents? There is no way to tell from the record what influenced the school board to what extent. The members of the school board made that decision given their background in education. They may know things about this area, and thus it is impossible to know preci the precise basis for their decision. However, the rational relationship What's test the difference between this and a parent committee uh, insisting on the burning of books in the school library? What's the difference? In what sense, Book, Your Honor? Well, books that, books that teach evolution are books that uh, discuss uh, a theory that is in some other respects contrary to fundamental uh, belief in the Bible. We have all large number of communities of that kind around the country. And, and aren't you saying that if the parents don't like it, they come in, burn the books, as well as discharge the teachers? No, Your Honor. Throughout, what's the difference? We have been advocating the use of a balancing test. But what's balanced here? Nothing's balanced here. They say the little children shouldn't hear about homosexuality. They should not be taught by an individual whom they respect and who is a homosexual. In Roanoke, we believe that teachers should be upright members of the community and set an example for their students. That is a different consideration completely than Your Honor's example of burning books. Which well, but if the teacher uses the books and assigns them to the children to read, it's the same thing, isn't it? They respect the teacher because she told them to look in the library. A teacher is a role model. A book is not. If the teacher says that the, that, that the book represents her views, then um, to a substantial extent, it is as if she had yeah. said what was in the book. But merely assigning a book does not stamp it with the teacher's approval for all of its contents. And that is why I conclude that it is the teacher that is the role model. So that it's really the fact that the teacher admitted homosexuality rather than she talked about it. Well, the, the district court found that there were two independent no, grounds. I'm asking you and your theory, not the district court's theory. Well, I think the district court was right, um, and that there were two independent grounds. First, the fact that she was a practicing homosexual, and second, the fact that she talked about subjects and she, said, and she refused to obey the school board's order to refrain from talking about those subjects in the future, which conflicted with the moral and legal values of the community. We believe that it is uh, the obligation of the school to reinforce moral values. Others may disagree, but I don't think that the judgment of the Roanoke School Board is unconstitutional because of disagreements in educational theory. Mr. Schiffman, let me ask you a more basic question. You've, you've emphasized the difference between a rational basis test and a compelling state interest test. How do we go about deciding which test to apply? That turns upon whether fundamental rights are involved. How do we decide whether fundamental rights are involved? This court has adopted two tests for deciding whether fundamental rights are involved in this area. The more general test turns upon whether the right is implicit in the concept of ordered liberty. What does that mean? It means... <laughs> the roots go back real far, Your Honor. It means that 
measured by history, by culture, and by law, whether an interest goes back that far, whether it is that deeply ingrained in the traditions and the collective conscience well, is of our it, people. Uh, is there a long tradition in uh, Roanoke or any place in the country of discharging people who acknowledge they're homosexuals? The tradition to which I refer, Your Honor, is the policy against homosexuality. Given that the state can criminalize homosexuality, I don't think that one could claim that there is more constitutional Well, there's a, there's a tradition over the years of discriminating in certain respects against illegitimates. I take it uh, that's in the same standard then. And if a discrimination against illegitimates is not rationally related or reasonably related, to use the term which the court used in the manual. Well, we're, we're addressing the question of which standard to apply. How do, I'm trying to find out from you how, how you decide which standard. And you're saying that it, you, you first find out if it's a fundamental interest, and you find out if it's a fundamental interest by finding out whether it's been traditionally regarded as important or ju justified discrimination. So I suppose then anything that's been traditionally accepted over the years uh, uh, would be fundamental. Something which is rooted in the traditions and conscience of our people is fundamental, according to the decisions of this court. The fact that it is important to the individual is not enough. For example, in the Rodriguez case, this court held that education is not fundamental, even though it's obviously important to the individual. What is required is more than importance to the individual, more than a resemblance to other constitutional rights. What is required is a source of constitutional doctrine looking to the basic values of our nation. The history of this court's due process adjudication has sometimes looked to one test, which is, is it found in a specific guarantee of the Constitution? And sometimes it's looked to a more transcendent test, looking to those values which are implicit in the concept of ordered liberty. But the appellee asks this court to go another step and to hold that homosexual practices are entitled to special constitutional protection, even though it is not tied to any constitutional guarantee or to any value which our people have endorsed as measured by history, culture, and law. Homosexual practices have been historically forbidden and culturally abhorred and legally forbidden for centuries. And one would have to invert the values of our society to hold that homosexual practices are in any meaningful sense fundamental. That being so, since there is no fundamental interest, the question is, is there a suspect class? We don't believe that this is really an equal protection case. We believe that the equal protection argument turns on the due process argument of whether the state has a substantive and valid interest in deterring homosexual conduct. For it, if, it, if it is conceded that the state may legitimately forbid homosexual conduct, then there is nothing inherently suspect about taking into account in, in, in fashioning state policies the fact that a person has engaged in such forbidden conduct. So if there is no fundamental interest and there is no suspect class, then the discharge must be upheld if it is rationally or perhaps reasonably related to a legitimate state purpose. One such purpose is protecting the normal sexual development and orientation of children. We argue others in the brief, preserving the moral values of society and strengthening family values. And any of those meet the, certainly will meet the rational relationship test. And we would argue that the interest in protecting our children and safeguarding them from abuses will most assuredly meet an even, even a compelling state interest test. I thank the court. Thank you, Mr. Schiffman. Please the court. My name is Arvid Roach. My colleague is Mark Johnston. We propose to divide the argument as follows. 
I will give attention to the constitutionality of Appellee's discharge on the basis of her homosexuality in terms of both equal protection and privacy analysis. My colleague will give attention to the constitutionality of her discharge for her classroom statements. I will hold myself open to questions on the vagueness issue, and my colleague will hold himself open to questions on whether federal power existed to grant back pay in this action. The equal protection standard that this court applies in determining whether or not a class is suspect was outlined in Matthews v. Lucas this year, repeating a standard from San Antonio case. It contains three components, a history of purposeful discrimination. Here, the appellants concede that component. A cause not within the individual's control and substantially immutable, and a characteristic which bears no relationship to the individual's ability to perform in society. Again, they concede that third component. So the issue in this case reduces to whether homosexuality results from a cause not within the individual's control and substantially immutable. Well, Mr. Roach, is it quite accurate to say they concede the third point? They concede that she was competent as a teacher before anyone knew she was homosexual. But as I understood their position, they say that the ver mere fact that the children know she's a homosexual in effect disqualifies her from performing effectively as a teacher. They do not contend that the fact of her homosexuality affects her effectiveness as a teacher. They contend that the knowledge on the part of the students that she is a homosexual affects her performance as a teacher. In terms of the general analysis of whether homosexuality is a suspect class, we only need the part that they concede. Now, turning to the issue Could of... Could I interrupt you for a moment to ask you? <laughs> the... The concept of a class at least suggests to me that uh, it covers a suspect class. It covers everybody who falls within the, uh, that, that class. And the homosexuals is a class. Uh, if there are instances where a homosexual can be dismissed because of his homosexuality, and I put to you the cases of the military or national security jobs, the Foreign Service, for example, things like that. If there are any instances in which homosexuals can have their employment terminated, do you then have a true suspect class? Your Honor, it's conceivable that members of any of the recognized suspect classes might, as a result of the property that makes them a member of that class, uh, have a disability in some respect. Uh, if the court, for example, had found that sex was a suspect class, I'm sure it would not have gone on to hold that there would never be a rational basis for excluding women or men from certain employment. Uh, if it could be shown that uh, members of a certain religious group or members of a certain national origin uh, had a disability in a particular employment, uh, I think that that would have to be weighted into the balance. But the first level of analysis has to be whether the members of the class deserve the protection of the courts of the United States against state impositions of burdens upon them. And that is where we have to look at it in terms of whether it's a discrete and insular minority, as was said in the Caroline yes, Products but you're case. For, you're forgetting the children, aren't you? This thing has to do with children. This has to do with how you teach children. Now, you, you have a client here that hasn't even undertaken to present both sides of this problem to her class. She's a propagandist for a point of view that is against the law. Now, doesn't that have something to do with this problem? And uh, it's just verbiage to talk about suspect classes. As a teacher, she has not taught properly. She's taught only one side of this story. Now, isn't, there, isn't that the nub of this case as far of all the fancy words of the school board? The parents don't like it, and the school board doesn't like it, because all she's doing is talking about one point of view. And well, there are two points of view, and she's supposed to be a teacher. In terms of the discharge for her being a homosexual, or known to be a homosexual, someone in the class, as far as the evidence indicates in this, in this case, raised the issue of homosexuality as another possible illustration of the disjunction between law and morality. And the appellee, the appellee then offered, as what she called a conclusion to focus class discussion, a statement that sometimes legal uh, uh, prescriptions and moral values don't co-align and that homosexuality is such a case in her opinion. She s stated explicitly in the Friday class that this was her view aside from the question of whether or not it was moral or immoral, abhorrent or not abhorrent to the members of the class. She thought about it some more over the weekend. She came in on Monday, congratulated the class for their uh, mature treatment of the discussion at the end of the Friday class, but then went on to say that she was still concerned 
that they were not able to evaluate her position without understanding that she had an interest. Now, if that sounds to you, Your Honor, like impassioned advocacy, then I think that we have some difficulties in prevailing on this appeal. But we have, have, it seems to me, all the facts in this case indicate that this is a professional, responsible teacher discussing a curriculum assigned to her by the school board. But in Mr. A way that's Roach, doesn't relevant. the mere fact that she came in and acknowledged that she was a homosexual indicate that she had merely presented one point of view before and she just wanted the argument to be evaluated in the light of the fact that she might have an interest in that point of view? She concluded the class by presenting a point of view. The class began with a discussion of the, the nature but of the law. But is not Judge Gazelle correct that she only presented one point of view? She did not get up and say in words, now there is also a view that homosexuality hurts everyone and is evil and should be proscribed by society. But that was clearly implicit in the first half of the class where they discussed the nature of law and the duty of obedience and in the discussion generated by the students themselves where they considered uh, how the social consensus ought to be arrived at that's enforced through law. Mr. Roach, let me take you back to the basic uh, first question you want to discuss about whether there's a constitutional right to practice uh, uh, homosexuality. You indicated that one of the three standards in determining whether the, there's a compelling interest or a suspect class, I guess it is, was the immutability of the, uh, yes, of the, of the characteristic. Does the evidence in this case indicate that there's anything immutable about being a homosexual? The evidence indicates that only a tiny minority of homosexuals ever submit themselves, they at this point can't be compelled by society, ever submit themselves to any form of treatment. And that of them, at now, the Now, did the district court so find? The district court did not consider the question of immutability. And so we, we, have, don't, we don't have a finding one way or another on the question of immutability then? We don't we? have a finding on equal protection at all. The issue was raised in the district court. Well, we can are we address it, it without a finding of fact on that issue? If you say in your own presentation that we must find immutability to find a suspect class and we don't have a factual determination on immutability, what are we supposed to do as an appellate court? Our position is that the facts are so unambiguous that it's an area where judicial notice is appropriate. And as I was outlining... Well, wasn't there fact, contrary testimony before the district court? There was no testimony on this issue, Your Honor. The equal protection claim was not considered by the district court. Well, should we address it in the first instance when we haven't had the benefit of the views of the district court? When there is a vital question of equal protection law before this court, when it has been fully briefed by both sides, who had ample opportunity to marshal the evidence, and when all that's at issue is whether judicial notice should be taken, this court is as competent to come to that conclusion as the lower courts. Of course, it's always open to this court to leave an issue to generate different findings in the lower courts, but our position, as I hope you can understand, has to be that the evidence is, is clear enough to find now. But do you, do you, you necessarily rely on equal protection then? That's, that's critical to your case. It is not. There are two alternative grounds for invoking the compelling state interest test as regards the discharge for homosexuality. And of course, the second ground is our position that homosexual practices are encompassed within any principled, reasoned elaboration of the personal autonomy values that this court has shorthanded as the right to privacy. And I will turn to that if you wish at this point. I do commend you to examine once again the medical evidence in both briefs, and I think you'll find that it's unambiguous. The issue of whether- I wonder about your medical evidence with respect to, to the fact that homosexuals are determined, they're predetermined to be such in their genes and that they have no control over, uh, over whether they are homosexuals or not. Uh, but is there a difference between a homosexual preference, uh, which is, and a homosexual act? Does uh, is it, is it follow uh, necessarily that because you have a homosexual preference, you are unable to restrain yourself from committing a homosexual act? There may be a lot of people of heterosexual have strong urges, but they don't let it issue in violation of criminal statutes. Well, no, no nor does it follow from the fact that human beings are capable of procreation that they have to engage in procreation. But that doesn't overturn the holding in Skinner v. Oklahoma that it's a fundamental human interest to be able to preserve your power to procreate. In the same sense, we have argued that, that sexuality under this right to privacy analysis, when it's accompanied by incidents of privacy, of intimacy, of emotional significance, of innermost importance to the individual, just can't be put outside a reasoned line elaborating the constitutional value of privacy. Now, the uh, beginning of the modern development of, of the right to privacy, as we pointed out, it has long-standing antecedents in Supreme Court 
decisions was the case, of course, of Griswold v. Connecticut, which involved the right of marital partners to use contraceptives. That case, as we point out in the brief, did not turn on the venerability or orthodoxy of the marriage relationship or its value to society. The court instead spoke of values of intimacy, bilateral loyalty, the right to express one's attitudes, the privacies of life. The six years later, the court, as we have discussed already tonight, decided Eisenstadt v. Baird, finding that the moral and health interests alleged by the state of Massachusetts, which they, which the Supreme Court of the state of Massachusetts had said were sufficient to sustain this statute, were not sufficient to sustain it. And all the commentators agree that the court was applying a heightened scrutiny at the very least and, in fact, was finding that the right to privacy extended to unmarried partners. And that's what the penultimate sentence of the Eisenstadt case said. It said the right of the individual, underscore, married or single, to be free from unwarranted governmental intrusion into matters so fundamentally affecting a person as the decision whether to bear or beget a child was protected by the Constitution. And the Roe decision and the Kelly v. Johnson decision just this year cite Eisenstadt v. Baird as one in a line of fundamental interest privacy decisions. The court in Eisenstadt referred to the decision in Stanley v. Georgia, which involved the right to possess obscene literature in the privacy of one's home. Again, the court in Stanley had said it was an aspect of a larger right called, in that case, the right to be free, except in very limited circumstances, from unwarranted governmental intrusions into one's privacy. Then, of now, course- Now, there isn't any intrusion on this woman's privacy. <laughs> Nobody's intruded on her privacy at all. The state- There's no, there's been nothing done with respect to her acts. Now, she, she uh, <coughs> shot her mouth off in class, and she got into trouble. But there isn't anybody trying to tell her she can't be a homosexual back home. The state of Virginia alleges a right to discharge at the moment that it discovers the fact, any teacher who is known to be a homosexual, known to them, that was their allegation in this case. They go on to try to argue some sort of rational basis in terms of the effect on the students of known homosexuality. But their claim is that if anyone is a homosexual, he can be discharged at once. So they certainly are concerned with the acts in question. They think that those acts in themselves are sufficient basis to discharge teachers. Who teach it? Who teach? Who teach it? I'm sorry. Teachers who teach homosexuality. I think I've responded to that point, Your Honor. I, I think it's very clear in this case that there was no advocacy that homosexuality itself was desirable. There was no effort to proselytize. There was certainly no overt sort of sexual practice or act or manifestation in the classroom. At the very most, at the strongest case the appellants have, Appellee was advocating a right similar to the right we're advocating in this court. Not to practice homosexuality, encourage homosexuality, but not to have the state sanction private behavior that can't be distinguished from other kinds of privacy that are fundamental. Now, the- Mr. Roach, uh, perhaps this is a a repeat of what Judge Gazelle was driving at, but does it necessarily follow that if she has a constitutional right to practice homosexuality, that the school board must keep her in their, their employ? No, it doesn't. We have to turn then to the state interests. And I think I will turn to the state interests. <laughs> the, the core of the state's argument is they've really conceded here by de-emphasizing their other claims is that there is some sort of, as we've called, carbon copy effect that takes place. If a teacher happens to be a very good teacher and admired by her students, they're afraid she's going to turn them into homosexuals. Now, we first pointed to six well, cases. Can we take judicial notice of the fact that students sometimes admire their teachers? We certainly can. We can take and judicial. And sometimes try to uh, imitate them in certain respects? Yes, I think we can take judicial notice well, of that. Well, then haven't you admitted that there is some potential causal connection between her admission of homosexuality and the possibility that some impressionable young student might because decide I, that's a good example to no, follow? No, I, I don't think that we can take judicial notice that one of the respects in which students try to imitate their teachers is, is their sexual practices. And Just I think everything that, else except that. Not everything else except that, either. Not everything else except that either. Well, how do we know there's this exception? Well, we have expert evidence in this case. But the district court didn't credit that expert evidence. The district court most certainly did. The district court said the opinions were balanced 
on the privacy question, which goes back to the quality of homosexuality in general, that medical evidence that we've talked about already tonight. They said there was no concrete basis in fact, that's a quote, for any finding of sexual influence on the, on the students. On these particular students? On these students, on students. There was no evidence. There's no evidence in the record. There are two experts that appellants call Well, would the case be issue. different if the record showed that there had been a homosexual in some other part of the country who was a teacher and some student in that class had de decided to follow the teacher's example? Would the case be any different? The issue is, does the evidence of a sexual influence r rise to the level of... No, no. The question is, can the school board rely on not yet demonstrated concern that something might happen to their children by this example? You're being asked whether... Wasn't she fired too soon? That as soon as some child became a homosexual in her class, then they could fire her? No, so I'm, that's the question that's being asked. I'm, I'm, trying, I'm trying to apply the principles of analysis and reason. I am saying that if, if, you, if, you, if, you, if you accord to the state the power to say there is no evidence that X harmful effect will occur, but it's, this, this hypothetical harm is great enough that the possibility, which we hereby posit, is sufficient to take action against you, then I think that you have violated reason if the state can't point to any causal mechanism for which any evidence exists in a community of scientists as advanced as ours. And we had scientific evidence in this case, and we've marshaled lots more in the, in the briefs. We cited a study done in Buffalo, New York, on a unit on homosexuality in the schools, much more extensive than any discussion in this case, involving taped discussions by homosexuals themselves of the, of the right to practice uh, homosexuality, involving what was called value clarification uh, activities, which must have been the same kind of discussion of pros and cons that we saw in this case. And the conclusion that that study came to was that there was simply no basis for parental concerns that there would be any impact on sexual or gender identity of the students. That's the conclusion. That's scientific evidence. We had two... Now, again, uh, just so I can sort it out in my mind, is that evidence that the court, the court makes such a finding? The court made a finding that there were... It just made a finding as to these particular students in this particular class, didn't it? It also made a finding that, there, that the possibility was not de minimis, but that it had not been established in this case generally, not, not just in this case with well, respect to these Well, do parents have a right to be concerned about a possibility that's something more than de minimis, but not demonstrable? No, it, the, court, the court looked, the court referred to the decision of the District Court of Maryland in Akinfora, and that decision had said that there was some evidence, it canvassed a lot of evidence, called a lot of witnesses, but there was some evidence that a known homosexual who was also an advocate, a, a homosexual rights advocate, and who was teaching pre-adolescent children might have a harmful effect on those children's sexual development. And that comports with what we've said in this case, because we've analyzed the etiology of homosexuality. We've agreed that it's not clear that it's caused physiologically entirely. We've agreed that the early childhood period is also significant in its causality. And therefore, there is a basis for concern about certainly aggressive and probably known homosexual teachers teaching pre-adolescent children. But that isn't this case. And again, I just have to, to be assertive in saying that if the state is allowed to invoke what the Tinker Court called an undifferentiated apprehension or fear against any defendant, or any, uh, as, as we had, plaintiff, uh, victim, if you like, then the state has no limits on its action. And especially in a context where we've presented reasoned uh, argumentation that for two different reasons the state has got to do better than rational relationship it's got to reach the compelling interest level. Well, you mentioned no limits on the state's action what are the limits on this court's power if we buy your argument when can we not uh, knock out any tradition or any statute that we think doesn't really square with our views of what should be done in society? Well I think the discussion to this point in the oral argument has missed a central feature of of the fundamental interest business we're concerned here with the dimensions of the right to privacy, not with some abstract concern with where fundamental interests might or might not pop up. 
And we spend a number of pages in our brief pointing out that the court has drawn lines and put things inside and outside on a reasoned basis, and that since Griswold in the last 10 years, the lower courts have been going great guns deciding privacy cases, and they've had uh, a consistent and principled understanding of what fits into this right and what doesn't fit into this right. They've Does that principled understanding derive from the Constitution in any way, or what, what's the limit on the, on the expansion of this concept? It's derived... Does it include, for example, the right to to uh, have a particular medical procedure performed or right to have your uh, husband in the operating room when a child is born, something like well, that. It doesn't include the latter. I remember, I remember the case, but... <laughs> well, why not? It should, shouldn't it, if you're... <laughs> I think I have to give a, a, a little bit of a detailed answer to that in, in sort of two steps. I'm hesitant to tell you how many steps, but... <laughs> the, 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 first, the first issue is, is there an underlying constitutional commitment to the integrity of the individual, to, as Justice Brandeis called it in Olmsted, the right to be let alone, to human autonomy, at least when innermost, most intimate, vital aspects of human individuality are concerned. The second step is then, is that consistent enough that we can put things inside and outside a line? I don't think the problem is whether or not there's constitutional basis for it. Because although there is some disagreement where it lies, there is no disagreement that it's always been vital to Americans, that it's protected by the Third, Fourth, Fifth Amendments, that it's probably implicit in the Ninth Amendment and in the Fourteenth Amendment concept of human liberty, of autonomy, integrity, human, human liberty. Now, if we look to, to specific decisions, pro and con, we have, as I've said, the decisions of this court we have additional decisions, uh, for example, in California Bankers Association a couple of years ago. The court, uh, the, not the court, Justice Powell in concurrence, uh, joined, uh, agreed with by another uh, four justices, including the dissenters, said that financial transactions can reveal much about a person's activities, associations, and beliefs. At some point, governmental intrusion upon these areas would well, implicate... But Mr. Roach, how can you call this a privacy case when the only disclosure was one that your client made herself? What, what I'm saying is that there, there are broader principles. There are principles of, of innermost importance as a human being. There are principles of autonomy. There are principles of not having the most vital aspects of your humanity either revealed to everyone else or invaded by the state. I'm saying that there are consistent lines, and outside those lines are commercialism, outside those lines are force, outside those lines are, are harmful effects on third parties, uh, and possibly other things. The, the, the issue before this court is deciding whether homosexuality can be rationally distinguished from the principles underlying the privacy decisions to date. Whether but, other things fit in or not are, can be decided are, aren't later. You over, aren't you overlooking the, that you're talking about a teacher? Well, yes, I am. I'm, I'm overlooking it in the sense that whether she has teacher. fundamental rights to privacy, uh, which include the right to practice her form of sexuality, doesn't turn on whether she's a teacher. Then, if she's a teacher, and if that causes harms that outweigh her rights, she can be terminated. Well, now, is it that clear? Isn't it possible that the status of an individual must place some restraints on their exercise of their liberties. Supposing the faculty of Harvard Law School decided that all of them would teach in the nude. <laughs> what, wouldn't, the, wouldn't, the, wouldn't the Harvard Corporation have some concern about that? <laughs> uh, now they're, they're, be, they're practicing their liberties. And we can't say that anybody can stop someone from being a nudist, but the position of teacher carries with it responsibilities. I don't think that the position of teacher is vital to that example. I think that the feature I mentioned of harmful effects on third parties is one vital aspect. The, no court has held anything more as, as, as regards nudism, no lower court, than that there's a right to consensual practice of nudism among nudists, not to go out and uh, commit nudism with people who don't want it committed. <laughs> Uh, se secondly, uh, quite, quite seriously, secondly, uh, there's, there's certainly an argument that the, that the Harvard overseers would have in terms of teaching effectiveness, if, if it's going now, to... Isn't that, isn't, that, isn't that all this case is about? The, the school board has a pretty clear idea. It's not very effective to have teachers standing up and saying, 
I'm a homosexual, and these laws against homosexuality are very bad, and we've got poor moral standards, and your family has poor moral standards in uh, believing that homosexuality is bad. What's the difference? Whether an aggressive advocate's position would be ineffective teaching is not the issue in this case. I again revert to my statement as to whether there was advocacy. Second of all, this school board has not shown there was any ineffectiveness. They have ignored the cases we cited, which held quite squarely a number of cases, that mere alleged immorality can't in itself mean ineffectiveness. You have to show a nexus to some goal of, of the organization. Even so, in teaching of minors? Even in teaching of adolescents, in teaching, if, teaching of people that are not of age. If they can't show, as they have not, that the practices have any impact on the students, or have any undermining influence on family life, or have any other harmful impact on the, on the effective operation of the school, disruption of discipline, uh, etc., they, they haven't shown anything sufficient to terminate this teacher. We can't allow public organizations in this society, which in fact employ some very high percentage of Americans, to decide who they're going to give jobs to on the basis of some group's concept of what's moral and what isn't. That really reverts to the vagueness issue in this case, that nobody knows what immorality is. Let's, that suppose, that the, let's suppose that the right of privacy, as we assume for a moment, uh, would uh, operate to invalidate the criminal statutes uh, of making uh, homosexual acts between consenting adults uh, illegal. Uh, yeah, the, we, decriminalization, the decriminalization of conduct doesn't mean that that conduct uh, in certain contexts is not a desirable thing. The decriminalization of, of gambling statutes, for example, doesn't, uh, fo it doesn't follow from that that in some contexts uh, uh, people could be fired for gambling, would it? Even though it was perfectly legal. No, I, mean, I, think, it, I think that's right. And, I've, I've, and, the I've, and, the same, and the same here. Well, I've, I think I've conceded willingly that if any concrete harm can be shown to flow from the practices, then that harm has to be weighed in the balance. No, we think it's a compelling interest balance. Can't you use common sense before the horse is stolen? Just like you say bank tellers shouldn't go to horse races. You don't wait until that bank teller has dipped in the till before you fire him. You keep him from going to horse races. If you have evidence suggesting a correlation, and if that evidence satisfies a level of scrutiny defined by the courts. We are addressing, A, the issue of whether there's any evidence of a correlation. Well, who's, who's to decide it better than the parents? The parents are to decide whether there's a harm. The parents are yes, always they, going to they decide. They know there's a harm. They protest. The, par the, the parents are always going to decide that what disagrees with their strongly felt moral views is harmful. Right. Whether that's accurate cannot be left beyond any re-examination by the judicial branch of our government. That's the issue in this case. The parents do not have a self-contained power Well, to Mr. Control. Roach, let me give you a, a somewhat similar case. Supposing instead of homosexuality, we're dealing with uh, marijuana, and a teacher came in to the class and said she thought the laws, uh, criminal laws relating to marijuana, marijuana were all wrong and they should be repealed. Yes and made a strong statement to that effect, at least a discussion of it. Yes. Then the following Monday, she came back and said, well, I probably should explain to you that I regularly and habitually smoke marijuana, and, but I want you to just evaluate that, to take that into account in evaluating what I said. Could she be discharged? The first issue would be, and this again goes forward to the First Amendment analysis that my colleague will address, whether her discussion of marijuana had anything to do with the curriculum. Well, whether assume it did. Assume she's talking about immoral laws and the prohibition against uh, marijuana, she says, is an immoral law. Then I, then I see no distinction in terms of whether But the point being that the, the parents might be concerned that that example might increase the probability that children in the class would want to experiment with marijuana. Well, would that justify her discharge? Understood. And we have the same two issues. We have the issue of whether the harm exists, and we have the issue of what level of, of harm has to be shown. We are not contending in this case that the right Let to privacy Let me give you one more fact. Let me give you one more. In the trial of the case, there is no proof whatsoever that any child was persuaded to smoke marijuana as a result of this activity. But there was a trial in a distant part of the country in which one child was persuaded to smoke marijuana as a result of this kind of situation. Well, the facts themselves don't produce a yes or no answer. 
If you're applying a rational basis level of scrutiny, it's conceivable that that would justify termination. It would depend on whether there were sufficient analogies between the two places and whether there was some concept of causal factors, I, I think. I think rationality means more than, frankly, some of the decisions of this court in the economic area indicate it does. But we're arguing that more than rationality is required where privacy interests are at stake. Well, but smoking Not marijuana that. at home is a privacy interest, isn't it? I don't think it is. I don't Why think not? because I don't think it goes to the same level of intimacy and significance to Makes the individual. For happy families. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think. Let, let me take this opportunity to, to respond to a previous point of, of Justice Cassell. The, the question was, aren't the parents the most competent to decide? And I submit to this court that if the parents decided that any teacher who exercised her First Amendment rights to advocate certain values or to take certain positions was thereby uh, disqualified from being employed, that would be overturned. It has been overturned. That's what the balancing test in Pickering well, is all about. In what case has it been overturned? That's what, I, I'm sorry, that's what the issue was in Pickering, and that's what was the Was that, did, did Pickering involve discussion in the classroom by a teacher? No, but, but the, 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 what was posited by Justice Cassell was, the parents are the competent ones to decide a priori across the board what goes to teaching competence. And I submit that's not the end all of the issue. Are there constitutional rights being infringed by that decision is the second question you have to ask. Well, the question I was asking really wasn't, wasn't concerned with uh, uh, the First Amendment right to teach in the classroom, but rather the question of the causal connection between the, the parents' concern of impact on students by reason of the teacher's example. And I'm wondering if there's any a different causal connection issue in the marijuana hypothetical I gave you as opposed to the homosexual example we have before us. I think you, you just have to go and find out whether there's any evidence. Expert testimony that can be taken judicial notice of, witnesses that can be brought in, analysis of causal relationships. If, if it's credible to believe that everything a teacher says or does is going to proselytize inherently or implicitly her students or his students, then I think we're in serious difficulty as far as any academic freedom and any personal freedom of teachers in this country. My time is up. I thank the court. Thank you, Mr. Roach. Mr. Johnston. May it please the court. As Mr. Roach said, I would like to address the First Amendment issues in this case and then hold myself open to take any questions you may have on the jurisdiction of the court below to grant the relief which it did. Let me begin by stating that, contrary to appellant's assertion, we do not contest the power of the school board to prescribe the curriculum of the public schools. Our position is simply that while it may prescribe the curriculum, the First Amendment places limits on the board's power of control over what is said in the schools by a teacher who is in fact teaching the curriculum she has been assigned to teach. Nor do we dispute that the school board has important interests at stake in what occurs in the public schools and that there must be a balancing between the teacher's First Amendment interests and the school board's legitimate interests. Let me just be sure I understand you, Mr. Johnston, on that. You, you then concede that the school board may limit to a certain extent what the teacher may say in the classroom. We agree that the school board can decide whether or not to teach social studies. And if they decide not to teach social studies, a teacher has no right to demand under the First Amendment that she be well, allowed Well, if they to decide teach to teach studies. social studies, can they limit what she says about social studies in any way? 
As long as it's well, tangentially Honor, related to social studies, she can say anything she pleases. Not necessarily. That's where we get into the balance. Well, how test. do we draw this line now? It we agree. It's a line, I take it, we draw based entirely on the content of what she says. Hey, your opponents seem to agree no, to that, and I guess you agree to not, not necessarily. I, I don't if, think they had to uh, allow themselves the to be pushed that If the school board doesn't need to offer social studies at all, can it not attach conditions to the teaching of social studies if it decides to have a social studies? As course? I say, Your Honor, that's where we get into the balancing test. <laughs> a teacher's First Amendment rights must be weighed against the school board's interests in deciding what is to be taught and how it's to be taught. And we would submit that this is a balancing test, as appellants have argued, but that when the teacher puts her First Amendment rights into the balance, rights which weigh as hev heavily as any in our constitutional system, a burden, a heavy burden, is placed upon the school board to circumscribe her exercise of those, justify circumscribing her exercise of those rights. We submit that the Tinker test, the test laid out by this court in Tinker, is, sets out the model of, of this burden that they must bear. They must show that her exercise of her First Amendment rights are disrupting the educational process. They must show that because the teacher has said something, has, as in this case, uttered her opinion on a subject, what she's supposed to teach isn't being taught. The students have been embarrassed, upset, classroom discipline has been threatened, or that she has abused Well, do you mean that she, the school board cannot eliminate sex education from the curriculum unless they're convinced it would disrupt the class? Um, Your Honor wouldn't be referring to the Mercer case cited by appellants, would he? Where? I, I haven't read the Mercer case. Well, the court doesn't answer questions. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, Your Honor, I agree that a school board could determine to have a sex education class or not to have a sex education well, class. Well, could they determine to, to eliminate the discussion of any uh, sex education in a social studies class? Could they say that's properly not a part of that broader subject? And could they take it more, more precisely? Could they say, we don't want you to say anything at all about homosexuality in, the, in whatever class you teach? No, Your Honor. We do not believe they could consistently with the First Amendment. If what the teacher says about sex education or homosexuality has a proper place in teaching the subject she was assigned to teach, if it's not something that's just totally off the wall that she's drug in because she's interested in it, and if it is not done in such a way as to disrupt the educational process, to subvert the legitimate goals which the school board has set out. What is your authority for, Mr. Johnston, any decision by this court that holds that a teacher has any First Amendment right with regard to what she may say in a classroom context? Well, I start with Tinker, which says that teachers, just as students, do not leave their First Amendment rights at the schoolhouse door. I would go on to Epperson, although that was technically grounded on the Establishment Clause. I think we can say that the Establishment Clause isn't the only thing in the First Amendment. There's been dicta coming down from this court for a good many years now, saying that teachers do have First Amendment rights, calling that the right to academic freedom, that those rights extend into the classroom, and that they are valued, and that a heavy burden exists when those rights are to be infringed. Now, I admit that a lot of that is dicta, but the question isn't whether it's dicta or not, it's whether it's true or not. And I would submit that there is no better case in which to decide that it is true and that it should be applied than the case here. Because here we have a case where everything said was highly relevant, undeniably relevant was the phrase used by the court below, to the subject the teacher was assigned to teach. Where everything said was said in a modulated and appropriate manner. That's also the finding of the court below. Well, if she had said, uh, uh, I'm a prostitute, could, would she have had a First Amendment right not to be discharged for that statement? Your Honor, it's, it's, it's not a simple absolutist test. It's not you can say this and you can't say that, and that's the end of it. It's you have a right to say things, but then we have to look and see what the effect is when you say it. We have to see if you embarrass the students, if you disrupt the educational process. We'll say there's no evidence of embarrassment in the case I put. There's no evidence here either, Your Honor. Well, I don't understand the embarrassment proposition. Some of the best teaching is when you embarrass. <laughs> Again, Your Honor. I don't understand the 
Again, Your Honor, I couldn't agree with you more. It is not an either or absolute well, test. Why are you taking such a narrow point of view? In this court, on the First Amendment, Your Honor, you're taking one of the most narrow points of view that this court has ever heard from an advocate, advocate dealing with First Amendment rights. Why hasn't she got an absolute right to say what she thinks about homosexuality if it's within the curriculum, as it is? I don't believe this court has seen any right, including First Amendment rights, no matter how important they are, is ever being absolute. But There's if I take, take the broad view, why process. can't she talk about homosexuality or Vietnam or marijuana or nudity or any of these things we've been talking about? What, 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 who is to say she can't? When taking it a step further, if there's a constitutional right to practice homosexuality, why shouldn't she be permitted to advocate openly and urge her class, uh, the members of the class, to practice, uh, to exercise their constitutional rights? I don't like to make appellant's case for them, Your Honor, but uh, just out of some kind of sense of professional integrity, I will. Uh, it seems to me, as I said, that the school board has any number of legitimate interests in what well, but let goes me just, on inside Let me just a rephrase the question a little bit. I'm, I'm really asking why, if she has the constitutional right that your, your partner contends she has, why should there be a First Amendment objection to her advocating that her students exercise that constitutional because, right? Because, Your Honor, a teacher who attempted to indoctrinate her students into thinking in one particular way, whether that way is popular or not, is a teacher who has abused his teaching position. And when a teacher abuses his teaching position, no matter what First Amendment rights he has, perhaps, probably, I think, the school board has a valid reason for discharging that teacher. Now, you, but that are you is saying not the that case because here. they're adolescents? Are you saying that our teacher just never can do it? That a teacher never can take a point of view? Your Honor, is it because I, you can't take a point of view with adolescents or that you can't take a point of view with anybody? That Harvard Law School can't teach a point of view about the role of the Supreme Court or a point of view about the rights of prisoners? I believe it can, Your Honor. Well, I then think what's the, it comes down to the, the fact that there is no hard and fast line. There is no either and or. You have to look at the facts. You have to see, did the teacher abuse his position here? Did he subvert what was But Mr. To Johnson, has this court ever held that there's a subject of discussion protected by the First Amendment in which a particular point of view may not be advocated? No, Your Honor. And I think well, then that you have that a, you, you have a, an entirely unique proposition you're asking us to adopt tonight. Uh, First time no, in Your Honor, that's, that's, that's not what I'm asking you to adopt. I think that that is perhaps the most fatal flaw in the standard which appellants have set up to try to limit appellee's exercise of her First Amendment rights. The standard they have set up is we will not allow you to express any point of view that undermines parental values. In other words, they have taken a standard of community orthodoxy and said anything that you say that doesn't fall within this standard, you can get discharged for. And it's that kind of favoritism. Yes, but their standard, as I understand, their, their real f fair reading of the parental uh, parental value standard as narrowed by the way this, court, this uh, school board went about it is anything that uh, violates a statute enacted by the legislature which condemns a certain practice. A sexual practice, was it? Um, I think they might like to limit their standard that way. That's not what they fired Appley for. They said including but not limited to talking about homosexuality. Anything that works to undermine parental values, you can get fired for. That's what they fired after. Yes, but the only thing that this record describes that undermine parental values is something expressly prohibited by a statute that's been on the books for years and years and years. And you mean to say a teacher has a First Amendment right to advocate the violation of a, of a criminal law to its students, to her students? I think a teacher has a First Amendment right to express her opinion that the law is wrong. I think we all have that right. Now, I don't think the teacher has the right to try to indoctrinate her students into her political or social or moral attitudes. But I think she has the right to tell her students what those attitudes are, so long as it comes up in the course of what she's supposed to be doing in the classroom. I think that's what happened here. And I think that because that's what happened here, Appellee was unconstitutionally discharged. Can she teach and advocate respect for fathers and mothers? 
I think she can express her opinion that we should have respect for fathers. Well, she's and indoctrinating then, isn't she? There's a difference between indoctrinating and expressing your opinion, Your Honor. Um, what Apelli did here was. Well, she says, I never respected my father and mother, but you all should. That's her opinion? That's fine. When she starts taking 45 minutes out of the 45 minute class instead of 8 to 10, and using all that time to say, respect your father and mother, respect your father and mother, over and over and over. <laughs> when she starts flunking students because on the exams they turn back to say, no, I don't respect my father and mother. When she starts saying there's only one point of view and all others are wrong, then she's abusing her position. But that's not what happened here. She said, here's my point of view. Other people disagree. I'm biased. So keep that in mind when you're assessing my point of view. And she took a tiny fraction of the class time she was assigned to use. And everything she said came up in the context of her teaching exactly what the textbook told her to teach, inquiring into what law is, why we have it, what is the duty of obedience. Now, I don't see how she abused her position here. I think that's why she, what she did is protected by the First Amendment. Again, not an absolutist analysis. There are a lot of legitimate interests the school board could invoke. None of them are present here, though. Mr. Johnston, I wanted to inquire as to whether uh, there was jurisdiction in this case to order back pay. As I read your brief, you argued that the uh, school board was a person within the meaning of the statute. But you didn't really meet the ground of decision that the district court relied on for refusing to grant relief against the uh, uh, school Your board. Honor, the reason we raised this issue at all, although appellants didn't, questioning our own jurisdiction, is because we read the opinion of the court below on it as being extremely confused. In one breath, the court below granted us back pay, and in the next, it denied us damages. It denied us damages because it said it didn't have jurisdiction under 1983, 1343 because the school board wasn't a parent, it wasn't a person. And it denied us damages because it said we could not state a Bivens type cause of action and invoke 1331 jurisdiction. What was the argument that, school, that the, this, why did the district court say there was no, uh, no uh, Bivens type cause of action here? I believe the primary argument made by the court below was that since we had 1983, and that seemed to extend liability to organs of state government, or And people. since the legislature had acted, that more or less preempted right. a, an implied constitutional cause of action. Well, what's the response to that? I don't think you responded to it in your brief. I think the response has got to be that when you're talking about constitutional rights and the protection of them, you don't infer preemption. Congress hasn't preempted anything by passing 1983 unless it does so explicitly. And I would say that there is a good reason why we can have a Bivens-type jurisdiction cause of action right alongside a 1983-type cause of action, and that is simply because that you've got a $10,000 in controversy jurisdictional amount bar to a Bivens-type cause of action. You don't to a 1983-type cause of action. Therefore, maybe it makes sense to expand the number of possible well, defendants for violations. Don't we have equity jurisdiction in any constitutional case? Why do we have to read all those statutes? We have equity jurisdiction, don't Certainly we? Certainly the court Equity has can do what's right, and isn't it right to give back pay? Uh, Your Honor, that argument's been made by a lot of courts. I don't think it's tenable anymore after the decision of this court in City of Kenosha, Why in not? which Justice Rehnquist held that the attempt well, to... Well, Justice Rehnquist didn't hold anything, did he? The, the court, court held well, something. Court. Justice Rehnquist, speaking yeah. for the court, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. At any rate, what he said there was... What the court what said the, I, am, I am sorry. I, I didn't, wasn't sure you wanted to be identified with it or not. Um, <laughs> what the, I apologize for that. What the court said was that the attempt to rationalize giving retroactive monetary relief as just another form of equitable relief just wouldn't do. The court said it comes out of the treasury. It's the same thing as damages. It's not an equitable relief. Now, maybe Kenosha was right, maybe Kenosha was wrong, but it stands there. And I don't think we can just say, well, giving back pay was a form of equitable Isn't relief. Isn't there an 11th Amendment problem involved here? Uh, no, Your Honor, there isn't. Again, referring to the Kenosha opinion, uh, 
municipalities are not states for 11th Amendment purposes, and the school board would be on the level of municipality. Uh, that's just precedent. I, hundreds of years old, over 100 years old, but that's the answer. Your distinction on whether a municipal corporation is a person or not turned on whether they had a responsibility for maintaining order, as I remember it. No, Your Honor. What we said is that the, the reason that municipalities have been determined not to be persons within the meaning of 1983, Monroe v. Pape did that, made that decision, is that Congress rejected something called the Sherman Amendment back when it was passing all the Reconstruction legislation. The Sherman Amendment would have specifically made municipalities vicariously liable for breaches of peace of the peace committed within their jurisdiction. Congress rejected this. The Supreme Court in Monroe v. Pape interpreted this rejection as Congress expressing its opinion, its desire, that municipalities not be persons for 1983 purposes. Now, we have argued two things in response to this. First, that the court was incorrect in Monroe v. Pape, that you just can't read the rejection of the Sherman Amendment that way. What Congress objected to in rejecting this, in rejecting the What's Sherman What's your second argument? Let's assume we're bound by Monroe v. Pape. How do you distinguish, uh, how do you distinguish it then? I think the second argument has got to be that even if municipalities are not persons for 1983 purposes, there's a distinction between a municipality and a school board. A school board who is not who are not trying to hold vicariously liable for the actions of someone else, but who are trying to hold liable for its own actions. The courts below, the lower courts, are split on the question of whether a school board is a person for 1983. Is that the argument you made in your brief? Uh, yes, sir, Your Honor. If I could refer you to, let me get the page, uh, page 41, footnote 36. We point out the lower courts are divided. This court has taken action consistent with a holding that school boards are persons. We refer you to your decision in Cohen v. Chesterfield County, but you have admittedly reserved the question in Mayor of Philadelphia. You refused to decide it at that time. Now, this is all in spite of Monroe v. Pape. This is not attempting to overrule Monroe v. Pape simply to distinguish it. Well, but you, you on page 43, you went on to say that the argument uh, for such vicarious liability was that such local government units had, as Representative Schallenbarger said, an affirmative obligation to keep the peace. And that was the distinction between a municipality and something like a school board. And I was wondering if a school board doesn't have any obligation to keep the peace in the classroom. Uh, well, not under the Virginia Constitution it doesn't, Your Honor. It has a duty to establish schools and run schools. Uh, keep the peace in the classroom, I think, is playing word games. Uh, well, I'm just what, using what your words is all. What Congress was... <laughs> What Congress was concerned with in the Sherman Amendment was the idea that since municipalities have a duty, or Congress thought maybe for, it could impose a duty on them, to keep the peace, to protect people from civil disorder, when someone was the victim of civil disorder, of crime, the municipality had failed to do its duty and therefore should be liable. Now, that's all the Sherman Amendment was about. Congress decided that just wouldn't do. It wasn't sure it had the constitutional authority to create that kind of liability, and it knew that that kind of liability would be ruinous to municipalities, many of which didn't even have police forces at the time in question. Mr. Johnson, did you cross appeal on the person issue? Did we cross appeal on the person issue? Um, we do have it in our brief, Your Honor. I guess that's a cross appeal. Is that adequate? Is that, does it, is, putting it in your brief, is that enough to give us jurisdiction to decide the question? Um, I believe, Your Honor, that this is the kind of question the court could raise sua sponte. That's why we put it in our brief. We were afraid if we didn't put it there, you'd bring it up, and we'd have nothing to say. Um, I'm not sure whether the person requirement in 1983 is properly a jurisdictional consideration. To me, it sounds like a cause of action consideration. But again, referring to Kenosha, it was treated as a jurisdictional consideration there. The court raised it sua sponte. Okay, the alternative basis for jurisdiction is under 28 U.S.C. 1331 with a Bivens type cause of action. Now, it seems clear from this court's decision in Bell v. Hood that we've got 1331 jurisdiction. 
we have alleged a non-frivolous federal claim arising directly under the U.S. Constitution. The only question, and the question the court below decided against us on, is whether we can have a Bivens-type cause of action, that is, a cause of action arising directly from the Constitution. Um, our argument here has been that there is simply no principled basis for limiting Bivens to redress of Fourth Amendment violations. Um, this court has been very free in inferring remedies for violations of constitutional rights. There is nothing inherent in the logic of Bivens that limits it to the Fourth Amendment. And we think the constitutional rights violated here are as, as important as the Fourth Amendment rights which Bivens, as Bivens attempted to protect. Bivens outlined two considerations which might counsel a court against inferring a constitutional cause of action. Uh, one would be the fact one would be the fact that there might be some policy considerations, considerations of prudence, considerations of federalism, which might make it inappropriate for the court to create a cause of action arising directly under the Constitution. Well, Mr. Johnston, if your argument is correct, am I correct in believing that the only significance of Section 1983 is it eliminated the $10,000 jurisdictional amount requirement for civil rights claims? Um, I would argue that that is probably not the only significance of it. I'd say that's, that's half of it. The other is that it established the color of law theory, uh, which I think arguably extends the reach of the 14th Amendment beyond just activities that are actually committed by the state and its agencies to activities that are committed by private people under color of law. I think that's a valid distinction. Um, well, but if that's a valid distinction, what about the defendants in the Bivens case itself? Weren't they accused of acting under color of law in substance? Uh, they were federal agents. Federal agents, but weren't they, they were not authorized to, to do that which uh, was accused to be wrong in that case, were they? Well, 1983 doesn't apply to under color of federal law. No, I understand, but, but uh, what I'm saying is if the constitutional claim is an original source of the cause of action, isn't it broad enough to cover an agent merely acting under color of law as the FBI agents were alleged to have done in Bivens? And if it's broad enough to cover under color of law in the Fourth Amendment, why not under the Fourteenth Amendment? The answer is, Your Honor, I don't know. I don't know. Uh, the Bivens theory of a cause of action arising directly from the Constitution just hasn't been developed far enough. Perhaps this Court will be willing to extend it to actions taken under color of law as well as actions that are directly perpetrated by the state and its agencies. But if that is so, I would suggest that it's probably so because we have a long history of 1983 litigation which already paves the way for that kind of a theory. In conclusion then, Your Honor, I would like to say that we'd like to ask this court to affirm the decision of the court below, but we can't. When it was granting relief, the court below denied us attorney's fees. <laughs> Since that time, Congress has passed the Civil Rights Attorney's Fees Act of 1976, which indicates that Congress has established a policy that attorney's fees be awarded in actions such as this. The act is retroactive. Therefore, we would urge this court to remand the case for consideration of whether You don't want to explore all the considerations that bear on retroactivity versus non-retroactivity? <laughs> Not really. In your remaining time. Not really. <laughs> um, my understanding is that the legislative history of the act indicates Congress wants it to have retroactive effect. Uh, I would urge this court to follow that legislative history. Of course, it's up to you to interpret the act. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Johnston. The court will take the case under advisement. And, oh, is there a rebuttal time? Pardon me. I'm sorry. Uh, Mr. Sheffman, is it? I thought the end. Oh, sorry about that. It's uh, five minutes to the end. Mr. Sheffman.
I didn't mean to deprive you of your First Amendment rights. <laughs> the, the appellee is entitled to attorney's fees only if she should prevail in this action, and there are several reasons why I believe that she will not. In terms of the academic freedom issue, the appellee's argument that she is entitled to select any relevant teaching method is deeply disturbing to us as a school board. We're not sure if that means that she can teach the new math if we want the appellee to teach the old math, and we're not very sure exactly what she means by a teaching method. The reason why we find her claim very disturbing is that she has a captive audience. The coercive power of the state has been used to bring Apelli's students into the classroom. They must listen to her. And I think that the state has a legitimate interest in dictating to a substantial extent what goes on in the classroom. We believe that the parents' constitutional interest to direct the moral upbringing of their children does not end at the schoolhouse door. We well, think- it begin there, does it? Begin no, it there. What's it got to do with the schools? I think the parents have a substantial interest in what goes on in the schools. Don't the taxpayers have a greater interest? That is true, and I don't see the taxpayers' interest as particularly distinct from the parents' interest, at least with respect to the issues in this case. I also think that constitutional lines can be drawn with respect to what goes on in the classroom. First of all, we believe that a teacher cannot, has no constitutional right to advocate positions which are contrary to the moral and legal values of the community. At least that's true in high school and in the lower grades. I don't think that anyone would seriously contend that a second grade teacher has a constitutional right to parade her homosexuality in front of the class or to advocate legalization of heroin. A line has to be drawn somewhere. And we believe that this court has drawn a constitutional line in between high school and college in terms of the religious cases upholding certain types of federal aid to colleges. Well, but you not concede to high then schools. that uh, this teacher could not have been discharged if she'd been teaching a college class. It, the case would have been considerably more difficult, and I'm not sure if we would prevail there. I think we will here. A second constitutional line which can be drawn is the line which was drawn by Mr. Justice Black a strong proponent of First Amendment values, when he said that he saw no constitutional difficulty at all in removing an emotional or controversial subject from the classroom. And that's all that the school board has tried to do in this case. In terms of the school board's interests in removing the appellee from the classroom, the appellee has raised the fact that we have not brought up any evidence showing that any of her students has yet been suffered impaired sexual development or had an impaired sexual orientation. Of course, that does not refute the existence of a danger that her future students or her current students in the future could suffer impaired sexual development. Nor, as Mr. Justice Gazelle pointed out, should we be forced to wait helplessly until someone does suffer impaired development as a result of Apelli's continued employment. The state has a solemn obligation to safeguard its children from abuses. Finally, I would like to add that the school board should not even try to demonstrate that any particular student has suffered impaired sexual development. I'm not exactly sure what the appellee would have us do, whether the appellee wants us to subject students to cross-examination about their sexual orientation. This sort of evidence is very difficult to prove in the individual case. That is because the causes of homosexuality are very subtle and not very easily understood. But there are, is a substantial body of thought which suggests that a homosexual teacher could influence students, could impair their sexual development. Dr. Alfred Vanderbilt testified in the trial below that when a teacher is respected, students will accept all of that teacher and all of her attributes, as I pointed out previously. They would accept for themselves the idea that it is all right to be a homosexual. In addition, there is a substantial psychological literature which supports our position. Dr. William Galen of the Columbia University Psychoanalytic Clinic, who we quote in our principal brief, says that when an authority figure permits a practice, that is almost tantamount to approval and perhaps even to seductive encouragement, that what the law does counts and what authority figures say count. And when they say that a practice is permitted, they may mean that it's acceptable or even approved, or at least 
a young person could so understand aren't, that. Aren't you now in the area that the district court said in its judgment, having heard the evidence, that the, the, the problem was very close, very in well, close balance? The oh. evidence in the district court presented by the appellate was not really directed at the question of the impact of a known homosexual in the classroom. Rather, it was directed at the question of whether homosexuals can make good teachers. And it did not, as, as I read the testimony, discuss the question of what happens when the students know that the teacher is a homosexual, what happens when she tells them that, that she is a homosexual. But in any event, I do not believe that either this court or the district court should try to resolve complex scientific questions of this nature. With all due respect, I don't think the courts have the institutional competence or the expertise to decide, decide this sorts of questions, nor do I think that these overarching scientific questions in support of a state policy should be decided under the clearly erroneous standard with respect to a district court. I think that would give the district courts too much power with respect to overall scientific provisions. I Your think argument, as I understand it, is that as long as there's some evidence in the record we must recognize that there's a rational basis for the premise, and therefore, and that's all you need. That's your well, whether one characterizes the standard as a fair and substantial relationship or substantial evidence from which the school board could reasonably conclude, I think that's all we think that we have to meet, either under the compelling state interest test or under the rational relationship well, Under test. that analysis, wouldn't it be possible for a school board to discharge a teacher for teaching evolution as long as they could get some expert witnesses to come in and testify that uh, Darwin was all wrong. The question is not whether Darwin was right or wrong, but whether it would impair the students in any respect. The question also is whether the well, school board... Well, but the test is whether there's some factual support for the, teacher's a for the board's action, as I understand you, and you're asking us to rely on evidence that the district court, court said wasn't uh, conclusive, but uh, the mere existence of the evidence shows there's an, a rational basis, as I understand you, and that seems to me would let anybody win a case by getting, getting the right witness to come in, and then you've got some kind of a rational basis. I'm prepared to accept a tougher standard than that, Your Honor. When the evidence is really closely balanced, if one accepts the district court's finding that it's 50-50 either way, then I don't see any real reason for the court to intervene. Instead, it should defer to the educational experts and not substitute its own judgment. This is more than just uh, a, a scintilla of evidence. This is evidence balancing out. And under those situations, I think the court should defer, just as the court in the Buckley v. Vallejo case did not try to scrutinize all of the evidence in terms of corruption um, uh, and, and, and impairing the integrity of the political process, but instead deferred to Congress, even though fundamental rights were involved. Finally, turning to the most, what I think is the most important issue, the privacy issue, I'm struck by the fact that the appellee has offered this court no source of constitutional doctrine other than the subjective values of individual judges. In asserting that there is a fundamental right to engage in homosexual practices, appellee does not rely on any specific provision of the Constitution. adults have a constitutional right to engage in homosexual practices. But even if they do, the appellee has no right to continue teaching when in so doing she might impair the sexual development of children. This case is not about appellee's private sexual life. I don't we have understand not how you say that their sexual development is impaired if they learn about homosexuality. <laughs> It's not learning about homosexuality that we object to. It is the fact that an authority figure admits to being a homosexual. How does it impair sexual development? We think that there are, Dr. Irving Bieber suggests that 10% of all boys enter adolescence with homosexual potential, and that what they need is reinforcement of moral values, telling now, them that it minute. is- you're talking moral values, you're not talking impairment, they may have greater sexual satisfaction in homosexuality. I'm not referring, Your Honor, to satisfaction. What are you I'm talking about impairment of sexual expression? <laughs> May I answer Your Honor's question yes. even though the time has ended? <coughs> Dr. Bieber says that a substantial number of boys enter adolescence in a state where they could become homosexuals and they might not, depending upon the, what they are exposed to. Mm -hmm. If they That's are right. exposed to teachers, <laughs> 
I've gone through 35 minutes without a word slip. I'm sorry. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Schiff. Or Mr. I thank Schiff. the court. Now, your time has expired, and the court will take a brief recess in order to decide the weighty issues at hand. <laughs> Although the clock might not reveal it, we've actually been deliberate, deliberating for several hours <laughs> and found the issues most difficult to resolve, and therefore we will not resolve the merits. With respect to the presentation of the case, we first should say that we're unanimous in uh, having a very high regard for the caliber of the presentation by both sides which includes both the written and the oral presentation. We, we thought it was exceptional. I should also say that the task of judging uh, the quality of the advocacy in a matter such as this is one that has always troubled me. I've sat on other moot courts before, and it's inevitable that the questioning of the different advocates is uneven to a certain extent because the judges interrupt one another and get interested in the line of questioning and so inevitably some advocates have a better opportunity than others to display their talents and, and that can just sometimes make the result to a certain extent fortuitous. But we were all very favorably impressed both with the uh, way the council handled themselves and dressed the court and uh, responded to questions even though they were interrupted and divided into subparts and one thing another. <laughs> but our conclusion on the, on the winner, the overall winners, is that uh, we're persuaded that weighing both the briefs and the oral argument that the appellant is the, is the prevailing side. And on the specific, uh, uh, the, the best oral presentation, which again was a terribly difficult decision, we have uh, unanimously agreed that Mr. Schiffman was the... Uh, <laughs> now I'd like to ask my colleagues on the bench to make a, a, a comment or two. Well, perhaps the the best comment I can make is that uh, this is the best argument I've heard today, and uh, that, may, <laughs> that may mean more than, uh, than you thought, because I heard five others this morning. Uh, I think it's really quite a remarkable performance in the presence uh, and scale with which the, all four of the uh, uh, council uh, performed for us, uh, and I think uh, I congratulate all of them. Uh, on the, this fine performance. I'd like to say one word. I think one of the reasons that the performances here are so good uh, is due to the fact that the Ames competition gets such tremendous support from the law school community. I've, this is my third time I've been here on the Ames competition, and I'm, I keep thinking that surely the next time there won't be a turnout that fills the whole room and the aisles as well. And I think, it, uh, I think that the reason the, the performances are from year to year uh, so good is due in large part to this, this tremendous support which the law school community gives to the, to the uh, Ames competition. And I want to uh, congratulate both the, the students who run the uh, uh, competition and the audiences who uh, add so much to it for what uh, has been a very enjoyable experience for me.
This is the first time I've ever been to Harvard Law School. <laughs> Literally the first time. And uh, I certainly want to agree with Judge McGowan's uh, comment. I think that I tend to agree with, with uh, what Justice Harlan used to say, that the best arguments are made at the district court level, the next best at the level of the Court of Appeals, and that the worst arguments that are made are made in the Supreme Court. That was certainly my experience over quite a period of years at the bar, and I think it's the experience of, of many others. Appellate argument is difficult with the um, tendency of uh, the judges to show off, as we all did today. <laughs> and in, a, in addition, in addition, um, it it is uh, it confronts uh, a great number of restrictions that uh, aren't perhaps uh, as apt to be present at the district court level, where the matter is of first impression. As you perhaps also know that uh, when a case gets to the Supreme Court, it's not unusual for the least qualified person in a law firm to feel that he's the proper person to argue before the august body of the Supreme Court. Maybe he's the only one who has a morning coat. <laughs> I remember, remember that famous story about Justice Frankfurter leaning over to one fellow who wasn't used to being there very much, said, how did you get here? Thinking in procedural terms, and he was told by the B&O. <laughs> now, I do want to say one thing of a negative character, and it may, it may uh, result from the fact that uh, I, this is my first trip to Harvard Law School. I felt the briefs were not nearly as effective or nearly as valuable as the oral argument. And I think it is because there seemed to be, on, in both teams, a sense that the job was to parade cases rather than to be advocates. And I think a brief is in, with, nowadays with cor courts, at least at the district court level and at any times that I have been in the neighborhood of the Court of Appeals, they are really advocacy documents. Time is being more and more restricted. Uh, arguments are being increasingly interrupted, as you saw. And a brief is an advocacy document and not simply a catalog of precedents. And I felt that both of the briefs, while they showed enormous work, enormous diligence, uh, incomparable ability to find quotes, whether in context or not, that seemed to suit the case, I didn't think, I didn't think that they were advocates documents. And I thought that both sides downplayed the facts. I also felt that it was somewhat bizarre that in an argument intended to be an argument to the Supreme Court, that the emphasis wasn't more strongly on the First Amendment. Now, those aren't negative comments. I said they were. They're just comments. Uh, this has been a great experience for me, and I'm delighted to have been in such distinguished company and, and uh, to learn a lot of things that I wished I would known when I decided Maclevich. Thank you. Thank you.
I was uh, requested to announce that there is uh, 